So, um, today I'm going to finally put together everything I was telling you yesterday about the constraints intrinsic to the schwinger kellisch construction for computing response functions, in, and in particular for response functions of conserved currents in a thermal background, and motivate therefrom an effective action for hydrodynamics that A will reproduce stuff that we've already seen before, and B will give us some insight into where um, dissipation and entropy production comes from. Okay. So before I get there, let's start by just reminding us of what we said. We said yesterday that the useful way to capture information that's there in the schwinger kellisch uh, formalism, the, the redundancy that's there, is in terms of a set of BRST charges. And in some sense, you should think of these BRST charges as a mnemonic that keeps track of unit microscopic unit health. Second, because they're sort of interested in correlation functions in a state that's prepared in thermal equilibrium, and then you're disturbing it away from thermal equilibrium, you have to keep track of the fact that microscopic theory obeys the KMS or fluctuation dissipation conditions. And this, I argued for you. I didn't derive it, and I don't think we have a derivation. Um, should be captured by what we call a thermal diffeomorphism gate symmetry. The upshot of those two statements, if you put them together, is that the, uh, the microscopic theory for, on, on the schwinger kellisch contour in thermal systems, is, at least at high temperatures, is constrained by the by the following symmetry algebra that exists two sets of charges, Q and Q bar, which are roughly nilpotent, and nilpotent up to this gauge transformation, which, uh, which are sort of elided over here. But they anti-commute to a thermal diffeomorphism. OK? So in some sense, it looks like a regular supersymmetric quantum mechanics algebra with Q and Q bar being su SUSY charges. And the diffeomorphism along the thermal direction, which if you're in one dimension, and beta is just uh, pointing in the time direction, would look like a uh, imaginary time translation. Uh, this looks like a Hamiltonian. Okay. This is going to be important that the thing that appears on the right-hand side here is uh, an imaginary time diffeomorphism, not a real time diffeomorphism. And you'll see that's why, at the end of the day, the current associated with this gauge symmetry would be the free energy current, not the energy current. OK? Now, as I said, two different, we derived it one way, and these folks derived it some other way. But this is, in some sense, not some version of this algebra is not new. The version of the algebra that is new is the presence of this gauge symmetry. If you sort of set the gauge fields to some background values, this algebra is actually very ancient and goes back to Martin C. G. Andros in the 70s and rediscovered by Parisian Surlas in the 80s. And you can actually understand how this is implemented by a simple time model, which I'll first describe in the morning, and then, then switch to hydrodynamics. So is it for the any temperature or where approximately for high or low temperature? OK. If I go back, it's believed that this algebra with this transcendental function is a thing that holds for any temperature. Okay, for any temperature, well, le let me put it this way. Temperature by itself is not meaningful. The meaningful quantity is beta times h bar times omega, where fre omega is the re frequency of measurement. That's a dimensionless parameter. And that's a parameter that appears in the, in the statistical factors, in the Bose-Einstein factors, because it tells you how the energy states are distributed. You can think of approximating this tangent factor by its linear form, either as a high temperature limit when beta goes to 0, or as a statistical limit when h bar goes to 0. But in both cases, it just says that omega is small compared in units of temperature. Okay? And it's that limit I will focus on, because that's the limit where the algebra is local. There is an algebra that constrains the theory for any temperature. It just happens to be non-local. And it's not clear how to write down effectively what the what, what, what kind of actions? In your command, you also see such kind of behavior. Like uh, the right hand side, the MIT group, it's clear that uh, it's a hard 
I mean, the tangent and the become the some limit, it become the just linear. But the, in your case, it is to we we only work in the high temperature limit. Ah, uh, your case. Okay. Because hydrodynamics is a low energy effective field theory, so omega is small compared to units of temperature. So if you wanted to go away from hydrodynamics, you would want to sort of do more. And if I get time at the end, I'll tell you what, what why it, that's a much more complicated problem in, from a different perspective. It's clear it's a complicated problem from just that algebra. Any other questions? OK. Let me start with this type problem. So, it's a one-dimensional problem, the sta standard problem that you might have all uh, seen before in your stat -med class. It's a sort of basic problem that is used to derive the Einstein relation, which is the precursor to the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So imagine you have a point particle that's immersed in some medium, and, that, and it's subject to some external potential, which I'm deriving from some potential function u. And it's, it undergoes frictional motion, this del beta here is just d by dt times beta. So there's a one derivative term, which sort of, and with a, fa with a coefficient nu, which tells you that the particle is not moving freely, it's being uh, uh, under, uh, dissipating by some friction term nu, and then subject to some external noise. Okay? So this is the Langevin equation, which, which describes the motion of a Brownian particle. Now, that you can, I can ask you the following question, which is, what Lagrangian gives me this action? Okay. So for the moment, forget this noise. I'll take, come back to the noise in a second. The first answer you'll give me is that, well, this is not a conservative system because there is friction here. And since there is friction, there is no way to write down uh, an, Euler uh, uh, an action principle whose Euler-Lagrange variations give you this, uh, equa this equation as an equation of motion. That's true. Uh, and that's true as long as you are willing to work with just one set of variables, just the x variables. We'll see that that's not true if I am willing to find a partner variable that does the job to complete an and give you an action. The noise is basically coming from the fact that the medium in which the particle is in embedded has fluctuations itself, thermal fluctuations. And that in, in principle, uh, that in turn imprints itself on the particle. Okay? Now, for this purpose, for the purpose of the discussion, I'll assume that this noise is Gaussian distributed. So there is a noise kernel, which is e to the minus n squared. And I'm integrating over all values of n. Uh, but the noise kernel has a width. And that's a priori, you might say, arbitrary. Turns out that's not true. For this equation to make sense, and for this equation to respect the fluctuation dissipation theorem, secretly, the width of this noise kernel of this noise distribution function has to be the same as this friction coefficient here. That's the statement of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Okay? So I'm assuming that you've all seen this before, and you've seen this in your elementary stat make class. So what I'm going to do is to sort of take this and convert and try to argue that there's an effective action which I can write down. And I'm going to do it sort of sketchily here, and I'll do it slightly better using the formalism I um, uh, uh, showed you yesterday uh, in the next slide. OK, so here's how you do it. Uh, but let me just write, write, write something in general. And so let me call that equation, equation of motion for x equals n. I want this as an equation of motion. Well, you could simply do the following. You could, you could imagine doing a functional integral over this classical variable x with a delta function imposing this equation of motion. But this is not good enough. You have to input, input a Jacobian. to account for the change of variables. Okay? So the standard fadier popov trick, this, 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 this integral is just one by the fadier popov uh, logic. OK, N now it's very straightforward what to do. You introduce a Lagrange multiplier that exponentiates this equation of motion term, the delta function, 
and you introduce a pair of Grassmann variables that takes the Jacobian and puts it also in the exponent. When you do that, you get an integral, a functional integral not over 1x, but over 4 variables and x which is here somewhere, yeah there and x tilde which is a Lagrange multiplier field and a pair of Grassmann variables which I have called here psi and psi bar. And clearly, by construction, this is guaranteed to give me, upon variation with respect to x tilde, the equation of motion for x, including the noise. Okay, and, and then to get, to write that that action, what I have done is I have also integrated out the noise field with a Gaussian measure. And since the Lagrange multiplier multiplies n, when you integrate out the noise field, you induce a, a, a quadratic Lagrange multiplier squared term in, in the action. There are a couple of features of this action I want you to keep track of. You might have thought you could write this action arbitrarily once you once you are out here. But you see, many couplings in this action are related to each other. New appears in different places. New appears in x tilde squared which is where it came from by integrating on the noise, new also appears in the uh, friction term, x tilde del, del x. This is the way this theory encodes fluctuation dissipation theorem. The fact that the, the, the noise, has, uh, the, the, the couplings, of, the self couplings of the Lagrange multiplier and the, and the couplings of the friction coefficient are related is secretly the statement of fluctuation dissipation in this action and there is a bonus and there is a reason why this happens once, once couplings in an action are related and in particular once couplings also associated with fermions are related or ghosts are related with those of physical fields, you start to suspect there is a bigger symmetry and indeed this theory has a bigger symmetry, it has a full supersymmetric algebra that I, that I showed you before and that is how these folks discovered it and what, they have, what it has is the standard for the upper power of the RSTC. Okay. So, so that is the statement for, for the derivation of this in, a, in, in standard textbook language and if you want to read more about this, I recommend the discussion in Zinjastan's textbook, it is somewhere in chapter 17. Um, but let us do this slightly differently in a language that will be suitable for us. So, one thing about this, this, this statement. This Lagrangian does not have the thermal diffeomorphism gauge symmetry and I will show you wh wh where that has disappeared in a second. What has happened is certain, the gauge field has been gauge fixed to background values here okay? and I will show you why in a second. But it has the BRST symmetry that I was mentioning. Okay. So let's let's do this again. Let's do this again in our language, and you'll see how how you could have derived that without ever knowing what the Fabio Popov is. Once you are, assume the supersymmetry, uh, the topological symmetry. <coughs> so I have my Brownian particle, and here I'm going to change variables. I'm going to call the the the, the particle uh, position variable capital X, but. The Brownian particle is distinguished by the fact that since it is undergoing frictional motion subject to noise, it is being bombarded by the medium and its particle trajectory is not uniform, it has jitter. Okay? And that jitter is what I have called x tilde, it is the fluctuation variable. It, in the previous slide it was a Lagrange multiplier. So I could think of the following, I could think of this Brownian particle as having a clock and I could talk about the word line theory of this Brownian particle where I think of x, the position in, 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 the, in the ambient space the particle is moving as a function of this world line clock. So I can write down a world line theory for this Brownian particle. So x of t is going to characterize for me what is happening to the particle as a function of the clock time running on the, on the world line. But I also have to tell you what is x tilde of t doing as a function of time. And because I am going to assume that the theory has this schwinger keldysh supersymmetry, I, I might as well do what I said yesterday and upgrade everything to a super field x which is going to be a function of time and the two super coordinates and then I have expanded out the super field in, these way, in, in this form. 
except that now the super field by itself captures both the physical position of the particle and the jitter on top of that physical position. The, the bottom component of the super field knows where the, what the physical position is and the top component of the super field knows what the jitter is. Okay? On top of that, we want to impose this thermal KMS condition. So, we should put down the thermal diffeomorphism gauge, gauge field, which whose expansion I, I, I had yesterday. Uh, and I'll, I'll, and I'll show you more about that in a second. But realize that it's a, it's a non-compact world volume. It's a non-compact world line. So you can gauge away the time component of this gauge fix. So, so that, that part you can just gauge fix to zero. A priori, there's no intrinsic dynamics to this. The non-trivial pieces are in here. And what I will show you in a second is that if you set one of those components, in particular the component that leads to the uh, a non vanishing value of f theta theta bar to a particular value, then you could just get back what we had before. But for now, let's just start with this and then ask what kind of terms are you allowed to write down in an effective action on the word line which respects the supersymmetry and this thermal diffeomorphism symmetry? Subject to the fact that x transforms as follows under thermal diffeomorphism. Under thermal diffeomorphism by, by a parameter lambda, x transforms as uh, lambda times beta d by dtx. This is a super field equation. Okay, so what can you write down? Well, first of all, you because of a, because x carries thermal diffeomorphism charge, you have to gauge you have to write down the gauge covariant derivative uh, uh, on x, which you can do. And then you can write down a kinetic term, which is just the standard kinetic term, but upgraded to in what using the gauge kinetic uh, covariant derivative. You could put on a potential, which in this language would just be a super potential in the x field. And that super potential would have to be such that the super pot the sort of bottom component of the super potential agrees with uh, after integrating over theta theta bar with the standard potential you wanted to have in the previous equation. But it also allowed to add one more term, which which, is get, which, which has respects all the symmetries, which is this particular funny combination of a theta derivative acting on x and a theta bar derivative acting on x. Okay? This has ghost number 0, and you can check that this is actually respects all the symmetries. And for CPT reasons, if you, if you worry about how, how CPT is realized, this, this particular coefficient has to come with a minus i out front. So this is an imaginary piece in the effective action. And it better be that the effective action has imaginary pieces because our system is not conservative, it has dissipation, and the dissipative pieces will damp out in time, and there is an I somewhere hiding in the action respecting them. However, the imaginary part of the effective action has to be positive definite, it can't be negative because otherwise you won't have dissipation, you have anti dissipation, and that secret, that, that's what in this language enforces that nu is positive and not negative. Okay? Because if nu was negative, this system would not, would not damp out, it would grow, initial conditions will grow exponentially in time. But that's it. These are the only three terms that you can write down in, in this uh, effective action. And it's, it's compact, there is no further pop up trick. What you can do now is you can take this action, the superspace integrals are trivial to do, you can plug in the values for the a's and check that there exists a simple configuration of this gauge field for which the action you would get by doing the superspace integrals here reduces back to the previous action. Okay? So I will leave that as an exercise uh, and uh, for, for that I will re refer you to some of the papers where this is done. Uh, I won't go through that exercise because I won't then get to doing the hydrodynamics. Okay. So all I want you to take away from this is that once you agree on the symmetries, the rules for writing on effective actions are very straightforward. There, there's, no, there's no magic anymore. All, all the magic is standard Wilsonian magic. So questions about this? So previously you talked about the Brownian motion <coughs> with Gaussian the uh, noise. Sorry? Uh, previous slide you talk about uh, this Gauss, uh, Gaussian noise. Yes. And uh, you 
saying that this will be related to the issue correction. Correct. But the, how about this? Like uh, you can also think of the other noise, non-Gaussian noise. Yeah. Also. So if there's non-Gaussian noise, then, it comes? The, then there, there should be corrections to this action. This action is written for the Gaussian noise still. I have not tried. I've, in the hydrodynamic context, you'll see examples where the Gaussian noise is not Gaussian. I see. It potentially super potentially change or like a, that potentially change the world. You, you can change this 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 term with some extra extra pieces. Some higher order. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Very good. So now, so that was all I wanted to say about the Brownian particle. I, I want to now move on to uh, going back to hydrodynamics. So let me go back and remind you about, uh, and, and we play the same game now that you under, understand the symmetries. We just have to implement the symmetries after identifying the variables. Okay. So. Let, let, let me say a philosophical statement about effective field theories that, that you all probably know very well, but, but I, 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 I feel it's worth saying once. You have some microscopic theory for which you understand all those, for which you may be given some Lagrangian where you understand what the degrees of freedom are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but once you start integrating out high energy modes, it's no longer clear a priori what your low energy modes should be. I mean, if you're doing sort of momentum shell integrals, in some small window, you may say, well, it's the same variables that you had in the, in the parent Lagrangian. But your, it could be a theory is flowing to some strongly coupled point, and your variables change quite drastically. So what, it's always a bit of an art form to identify what are the right variables that survive the low energy theory. Okay? So if I asked you if you, didn't, if you didn't have any other piece of information, and I told you, start with QCD, and around uh, below the electrobic symmetry breaking scale, uh, when, when you just have hadrons, the effective field theory of, uh, uh, effective field theory is the chiral Lagrangian parameterized by pion fields. You're going to say, where did these pion fields come from? Okay. The pion fields came from because we, we know pions exist in nature, and we understood how to think about them in terms of chiral symmetry breaking uh, as Goldstone mode, and we identified them as the low energy mode that would survive at the relevant scales when we write down our effective field theory. So like, but, but that's all a, a piece of intuition that's governed both by actual observations and understanding what, what, what symmetries govern the low energy theory. And using and finding variables to appropriately write down the low energy theory. And the same is true for any other effective field theory, including hydrodynamics. So what I'm saying here is, is in, in the context of hydrodynamics is, is going to be the following. Hydrodynamics, unlike the pion effective field theory for QCD, has to be true for any quantum field theory, as long as it's interacting. Once you once you start it in a thermal state and integrate out the high energy mode and get to low energy. So, in some sense, the variables of hydrodynamics as an effective field theory better be universal. Better be, better not care about what underlying microscopic theory you started from. And we have already seen that. Given that the hydrodynamic equations of motion were constrained to be conservation laws, those variables be better, better be such that upon variation with respect to those variables, you get the conservation laws and nothing else. This immediately constrains what hydrodynamic effective variables has to be. And it has to be exactly these sigma model maps that we talked about two, day, two days ago where you should think of the hydrodynamic effective field theory as in the language I just mentioned for the Brownian particle as a world volume theory from some intrinsic world volume with, with some intrinsic coordinates and a, and a reference thermal vector map. And the physical variables are mapped from this reference world volume to the physical fluid, such that the push forward of this thermal vector is actually the physical temperature and velocity of the fluid. So the variables are just these x mu of sigma. And as I said last time, because x mu enjoys diffeomorphism in target space, the equations of motion with, res of with respect to x mu are guaranteed to give you energy momentum conservation. OK? So there is no intrinsic metric on this world volume. The only metric that we are going to use on the world volume is the pullback metric. OK? So this is the picture we developed for hydrodynamics by just studying the Lagrangian class of solutions to hydrodynamic uh, uh, 
this idea, but this is the equation. Now, all I have to do is that, that, that these variables can't disappear. This, this x new variables have to survive, except that now I have to upgrade my story to account for both the schwinger keldich and KMS constraints. So, I'll do that in two steps. The first of those is easy. I'm just going to ask that in addition on this world volume, in addition to my physical coordinates, I also have the super coordinates theta and theta bar and my x coordinate in target space also gets upgraded to having its partner super, super, uh, super directions theta and theta bar. I will keep the metric in, in, in space time which is, a, which is just a background field. I will choose it as I like. So, I am going to choose it such that I have some physical components g mu nu which talk about the physical space time directions which I am going to use to measure the energy momentum tensor and I am going to gauge fix in the theta theta bar directions, I am going to gauge fix it such that the metric uh, in the theta theta bar component of the matrix is i. Okay. I will also gauge fix, I will also do a pullback in, in what you might call the, the, the static supersymmetric gauge where I will identify the, the world volume Grassmann coordinates with the space time target space Grassmann coordinates. This is just a simplicity which, which eliminates some redundancy in the discussion. And the x field gets upgraded to an x super field again with the bottom component being the physical degree of freedom that captures the hydrodynamic variables and the top component being the fluctuation associated with the hydrodynamic degrees of freedom. Now unlike the Brownian particle which was in one dimension, I am now in higher dimensions. So when I pull back and push forward things I have to be covariant. And target space covariant tells me that x tilde can't appear by itself here; it has to appear with Christoffel symbols and, and, appro and appropriate fermionic coordinates. Okay, this just comes from working out what covariance means in this in this way. Okay, so we are we locally done with uh, with defining what our matter fields are. Our matter fields are just sing, sing, simply captured by this x super field, which encodes both the physical hydrodynamic degree of freedom and the fluctuation of the hydrodynamic degree of freedom. So, those are the fields and we are going to write down an action on this world volume for these fields x in a second once I tell you one more piece of data. The second piece of data is we have to decide what are we doing with the reference uh, vector uh, thermal vector on the world volume. And the, on the world volume, the reference thermal vector was just some gadget that roughly told us what the inertial frame was and what we are going to do is we are going to fix it such that it points in, in space time directions and kill all its super components. It is another gauge choice that we are free to make. But that, that, that will have some, but that is not enough, we also had to impose the KMS thermal diffeomorphism symmetry. So, on this world volume in addition there is a physical degree of freedom in this theory which is the thermal diffeomorphism gauge field. The our friend this A super field one form uh, gadget. So, x will transform under this thermal diffeomorphism as follows exactly the way it was transforming in the Brownian particle, it transforms by that by lead under lead by lead, lead derivation under this beta vector, uh, in fact super lead derivation under this beta vector because everything is in, in super space and you can you can take this beta vector once you have solved the equation of the motion for x and push it forward to the target space and find what the physical target space beta is. And for the purposes of construction what we are going to do is we are going to take the space time matrix and pull it back to write down a target a world volume matrix which will be which will enter into the explicit form of the action. So, what we have is a curved world volume with coordinates sigma theta and theta bar with an induced matrix g hat the g circle ij with a fixed reference vector beta and a gauge field one form living on it. That is our data. 
and I just have to write down a sigma model action on this space with these pieces of data for this, vari for this variable x. No, so, so the viscosity will not change at all. It will be encoded in, in terms in this Lagrangian, and I'll show you an explicit form for the viscosity piece in the Lagrangian in a, in a while. In the case of a noise, of, of the special noise. Correct. So both, the, uh, how about the uh, frequency noise? No, so, what, so both the physical viscosity and the fluctuation associated viscosity would be encoded in the effective action, and, and you will see it explicitly in, in a few slides. OK, OK. okay. So, so in, indeed, this sigma on, on this world volume, the sigma model will have various terms. Some of them will correspond to equilibrium data for the fluid. They will just correspond to pressure terms. Some of them will correspond to viscosity. But because the action comes with both x and x tilde, and they're correlated by being a part of a single superfield, it immediately follows that the fluctuations associated with viscosity will come from the same term that viscosity comes from. So in some sense, this is a very clever way of encoding fluctuation, dissipation, and the constraints of unitarity in one go, and the superfield takes care of everything. You don't have to think too hard to impose additionally a new constraints. Okay? So that's what I just said here. It, this, by, by writing down the right, right theory, you will capture all the low energy influence, uh, constraints of low energy influence. Huh? So I'm going to make uh, one caveat right now, and, and I'll say it so, so a couple more times as we go along. The one caveat that I'm going to do, I'm going to write down the matter Lagrangian in what I discussed for now. Okay? So I'm going to write down the Lagrangian, which primarily involves x and its covariant derivatives, and maybe it's built out of g's, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I will not write down the kinetic terms for this a field. Okay? So that's something we have not worked out um, for technical reasons. It's we know what the theory is, it's just a bit messy. We know that it, the, a, the A can't have Yang-Mills dynamics, okay? Because the, 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 the symmetry where A came from came from thermal diffeomorphisms coming from schwinger kelly So it, it had better have some kind of topological gauge dynamics. So the topological BF term, which should be written down on this Lagrangian, but anyone who studied BF terms in, in, super, in, in uh, topological field theory realizes that in arbitrary dimensions, BF terms can be arbitrarily complicated. So that's one reason this has not been written down. But I'll make one assumption coming from that kinetic term, which I'll, which I'll spell out in, in, in what follows. OK, so before I do that, let me just tell you what are all my variables. OK? So, you might say this seems like a real overkill because this picture looks nice, it looks very schematic, but when you actually think of the number of variables you have to write down, to write down the action, you, you start scratching your head saying, why, why did you ever come, come to doing this? Because the gauge field itself had these 12 components, and then there are four components for this X field, so you have altogether 16 components, some of which have funny space-time indices, some of which have funny world volume indices, uh, and they're all in in, in some funny multiplets. So by the time you're done, you're, you're left with having to write down a very complicated action. Thankfully, the life is a lot simpler if you only want to understand the physical consequences of things like viscosity and associated fluctuations. You don't have to turn on any of the terms which have carry non-zero ghost number. So you can, you can sort of truncate this ma massively and, 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 and analyze what happens, or you can you can study formal properties of this action and derive consequences without ever writing down explicit terms. In most of what I'm going to do today, I'm going to show you those formal properties because they, they give you a lot of insight into what's actually going on in hydrodynamics. In, in one of the papers from earlier this year, you'll find explicit examples worked out uh, after doing some suitable choices of these variables. And I, if you're interested, I can, I can point you to where it is worked out in detail. Now, what I said here is, OK, so now, at, at this point, you, you should all have, have objected to something, which is the following. I said 
Schwinger Keldish has a topological symmetry coming from the difference operator correlated vanishing and then it has this thermal diffeomorphism symmetry. But if I wrote down a topological sigma model on this world volume subject to the gauge constraint, then you should worry how do I actually extract physical information? Why is it that I am actually getting information about a physical fluid? Okay. A topological sigma model will not give me interesting information about anything physical, that is true. So, the physical fluid is not given by the topological sigma model, but by deformation thereof. Why is that? Remember that we said that the way we should understand hydrodynamic response functions is by doing a sequence of many disturbances followed by one measurement. Now, imagine the scenario where you did only disturbances. That gives you 0 because you are doing the same thing over and over again on both sides of the schwinger keldysh contour. And so, the response functions in hydrodynamics are the leading correction to a theory whose partial function is 1. When I do nothing, I, I, I told you that what happens in the schwinger keldysh functional integral is that I reduce my functional integral back to the trace on the, trace on the initial state, which if it is normalized, gives me 1. So, I want the leading correction to that 1. That is why this topological sigma model approach is useful for hydrodynamics, because you can start with a sigma model, which is explicitly written down to be topological and break the topological symmetry by adding an explicit source term which would induce which would introduce the rest the measurement I want to do in the far future. Okay? So it is very important that what you can constrain is just the topological sector, but thankfully what we are trying to understand in hydrodynamics is a leading correction to the topological sector. If I had to try to compute correlation functions of many difference operators followed by a series of average operators, I cannot use this logic. So, there is some, so it was important that hydrodynamic correlators were a special class of correlation functions that were almost topological, but not quite. So, what we will do at least for energy momentum transport is we will evaluate the action and when it comes to actually extracting physical information, we will take our induced matrix and add to it an explicit source term, which will pick out the physical pieces of transport and, and tell us what is happening in the fluid. Is this point clear? Can I skip? Yeah. Now you have the upwards on the uh, high temperature. Yeah. How are they low temperature? Uh, we do not know how to make a useful, I think the symmetries that I talked about broadly speaking are still relevant. I do not know how to write down the theory in an efficient manner because you have to, that may, maybe it is easier to show you here. You have to understand this algebra and no one knows how to understand this algebra. Yeah, I understand that yeah. point, but okay, theoretically you would get this start from the uh, High temperature, and yeah. you'd get some block of the, from high temperature to low temperature. No, so, uh, so, so, so say again. Uh, the, how do you understand how there is a connection between high temperature low temperature in the sense of the conserving on the topological charge? You... Well, the topological charge becomes suitably non local at low temperature. So, the, 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 I, I, can say, I can say words which, which formally, which, which if you know a little bit about deformation quantization, that makes sense, but I, I do not want to say it just, just yet, so ask me afterwards. Okay. I, I think there is some star algebra here which, which, which upgrade what I am saying, but, I but, I, yeah. but, but I, I do not want to say, I, I do not know what the right story is for low temperature, so I, I do not want to say. Okay, so then th this slide is related to my uh, point earlier about the absence, the, the fact that we are not actually carefully working on the gauge, gauge, gauge dynamics. Um, so, there is another point that you should have objected to, 
which is I kept saying that I want to talk about dissipation, but uh, if you actually go through my construction so far, you'll find that my, my, th th there is no place where I made a choice about what, how time reversal was broken in my theory. The microscopic theory was time reversal invariant, in particular schwinger keldysh uh, correlators both have both advanced and retarded pieces. You could have talked about the time ordered guy or the anti time ordered guy. Okay. And uh, in some sense, there are two approaches to this. One is you make a choice a priori of how time reversal symmetry is broken. That was done already in this Langevin discussion by the choice of nu in the equation of motion. The sign of nu was constrained to be positive and that told you that it had friction and not anti-friction. I was not doing that a priori, so my, my coefficients in my effective action could have either sign. So they could be both dissipative or anti-dissipative. And in fact, this is the right answer in some sense, in the following uh, uh, way of thinking about it. You see, the purely dissipative modes do not form a complete set of states in the for, for, for evolution. To have, and, and this is much clearer if you know something about quasi normal modes, but, but let us not go there for a moment. To have a, com to have a complete description, you would need to have both the dissipative sector and the anti dissipative sector. That is complete. Now, in most discussions, the choice of time reversal symmetry is breaking is put in by hand. We claim that is not necessary, but rather this theory has the ability to dynamically break time reversal symmetry by a choice of vacuum. And the choice of vacuum is one where this particular ghost number 0 gauge invariant field strength picks up a web. And the sign of the web and, the, and, and it's the pure fact that it is purely imaginary. Uh, the sign of the web fixes which vacuum. So if it was plus i, it would be anti-dissipative. If it's minus i, it will be dissipative. And the i comes from 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 um, the CPT involution, from the fact that this is our CPT symmetries were implemented by theta into by theta bar. So if there is anti-dissipation both, is there any like a divergence like the S type does? Yeah, I mean, if you have an anti-friction, if you take the Langevin equation and change the sign of nu, your particle will just not propagate; it exponentially grow in time. Okay. I mean, dissipation means that things exponentially die off in time. Anti-dissipation means things exponentially grow in time. Yeah. This this choice is equivalent to picking gauge fields to satisfy this background value. Because once you pick a theta to be theta bar times minus i, f theta theta bar is i, minus i. Okay? Now, this choice is what is made in the statistical mechanics literature. So, when I showed you this, this algebra that was well known in the statistical mechanics literature, and uh, you get this, this assumes that you made this particular choice and, and you picked out a symmetry breaking vacuum that is actually dissipated. Now, of course, it, it makes perfect sense that the statistical mechanics literature, which is what we are calling MMO limit, since we learned it from these guys, uh, we picks out a priori chooses the dissipative vacuum because they are interested in the dissipative sector of the theory, not the anti dissipative. But this theory has the theory I'm, the, I'm going to show you. We will impose this as a super selection rule, but it's something that should come out naturally from the gauge dynamics if we had bothered to work it out. Okay, questions? Okay. Yeah. What about the re reflection symmetry? Which reflection symmetry? No, the You introduce, uh, you know, some kind of the uh, frequency on the spatial frequency. You'd get uh, some kind of origin, reflex, 
okay, um, or the reflex or mirror symmetry on this kind of things. You, you don't have any kind of the... Um, no, we don't have any spatial reflection symmetry. Okay. I mean, I've, I've imposed piracy, but I've not imposed very spatial reflection. Also, vacuum is the degeneracy in these situations? Vacuum is the degeneracy vacuum what? Yeah, in the vacuum, uh, actually, the, va the degeneracy of the vacuum doesn't matter because they're in, they're in the high temperature thermal density matrix. Yeah, okay. Previously, my question would be related to the degenerative vacuum. Yeah, yeah, no, but okay. I'm, I'm not in the vacuum at all. Yeah. Yeah, your low temperature question would be related yes. to the vacuum. Yes. Okay. So let's put all these rules together and um, you'll see the payoff. The payoff is just all hydrodynamic effective actions are written in one function of a certain set of variables that you can go and expand to whatever order you like because this is now an effective action with definite symmetry principles. So the Lagrangian is a full superspace integral built out of, built with the following set of rules. It has to respect the topological and thermal diffeomorphism symmetry. The fact that it's a top superspace integral respects the topological symmetry. And the thermal diffeomorphism symmetry means that everything that you see inside this Lagrangian better be gauge covariant and in the in indices appropriately contract. In addition, because it's a fluid, we should respect target space diffeomorphisms on the fluid. One point on the fluid is no different from some other point on the fluid, so that's the symmetry of the fluid, which in particular means that you can't write on potential terms in space time. Okay, they can't potentials u of x, unlike in the line one problem, because the fluid is not biased towards one point in space time as opposed to some other. All that means that x can only appear in this Lagrangian in a diffeomorphism invariant form, and the only diffeomorphism invariant object where x can appear is this induced matrix gij. Okay, the gij is just some upgrade of this guy. The pullback of the space time matrix into, into this guy. So, it's the same kind of logic you would use to write on the DBI action for D brains because the target space diffeomorphism tells you that what you get is the square root of the induced matrix in the DBI action. Here, you could write down some other terms involved in the induced matrix, but they have to be a function of the induced matrix. The volume diffeomorphisms are partially broken, you have only diffeomorphisms where the, the Grassmann coordinates can shift by Grassmann functions of coordinates, but the coordinates can shift by arbitrary, um, everything can only shift by functions of space-time coordinates, not by Grassmann coordinates. Okay, that, that has a consequence, which I'll, which I'll come to in, in, the, in the symbols up there. This is the CPT involution that we are implementing uh, by theta goes to theta bar that, that tells us that constraints, signs, and imaginary uh, i's in various piece places of my Lagrangian. And total ghost number should be conserved. And in fact, this Lagrangian should have ghost number uh, 0 because ghost number plus, plus 1, minus 1 soaks up to this piece is ghost number 0. OK. So let me explain the various symbols here. And, and some of them you've seen, some of them you've not seen. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through that, and then we'll try to see what, what this means. So first of all, x has carries thermal diffeomorphism charge. So x is not scalar under thermal diffeomorphism. So when I pull back x, I have to pull it back with the a gauge covariant derivative, so my induced matrix Gij is going to be G mu nu, let's say, times the covariant derivative Di x mu, covariant derivative Dj x nu, but since there's a covariant derivative piece here, and since di x mu has gauge pieces, trans, uh, has the term bracket with respect to the gauge field, you can see that the measure factor, 
which would have been the usual pullback of partial x has an extra matrix element involving the A. Okay? So, when you write down the measure on the world volume, you have to account for this and that changes the measure from square root minus g to square root minus g over this z function with z is just this piece. It is just a trace of this matrix which shows up when you compute the measure. So, the measure is non-trivial and that is important. Function of gij you understand, I just wrote it what, what there is, beta is something that is given to you on the world volume. Now, um, we have one more piece of complication in this problem which is that gij was an induced matrix. Okay, so, it was not given to you intrinsically, so it was coming from somewhere else. But the problem with gij is that it involves the x is all right, but it also involves the gauge p. So, you have to ask yourself what is the connection associated with this matrix G i j? It is not the standard Christopher connection for this matrix. Okay? So, so there is a gauge covariant, there is a there is a diffeomorphism and gauge covariant derivative script D, which you have to work out. It is a non-trivial fact that one such exists satisfying some some fundamental requirements and once you work it out that is the when you take derivatives of tensorial objects on the world volume that is the thing you have to differentiate them with respect. So, they are both diffeo and gauge covariant on the world volume. Okay? So, I am just saying what, what I am saying something usually when you talk about space time with induced matrix you do not think about this question because you say well I have a matrix I can write down its Christopher connection I can compute with its Christopher connection not true if your matrix is not come is coming as an induced matrix. This is in fact not even true for the D brain because for the D brain the induced matrix is a func is a matrix valued function and it is it is it is not obvious that the connection that you have to get is the Christopher connection. And because of restricted diffeomorphisms you find that the matrix can the, this covariant derivative acting on the matrix on the world volume matrix does not annihilate the matrix completely it in fact leaves two pieces of the matrix unannihilated. Ok, so there are two ghost numbers two two objects that carry non trivial ghost number plus minus 1 which are basically the the super derivatives of the induced matrix uh, super covariant derivatives of the induced matrix they are physical fields because they, 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 they respect all the symmetries are covariant and uh, you can use them in the Lagrange. Okay? So, there is a non-trivial piece of differential geometry involved in, in, in doing this exercise, but can, it, it can be done uh, and once you do that you have identified all the variables that you can use to write down the action. So, I will not tell you all the technicalities because that, 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 that we do not have time for, but again it is all worked out in, in detail in, in particular if you want to see what the construct why how to construct such a D you should go look at the at the at one of the references which I can, which I can point out. Okay? So, hopefully by now all the pieces of the puzzle are clear you have seen what the variables are what the symmetries are and you just have a single function uh, so you, you have to write down a Lagrangian density that respects those symmetries in built out of these variables. Now, it is not that complicated because now I have distilled everything to standard rules of writing Lagrangian in terms of matrix, derivatives, auxiliary fields, etcetera, etcetera. So, you can write down any set of terms that you like to any order and analyze what their properties are. I will show you some terms in, the, in, in, in a while. But before I do that, I want to tell you some general features. So, here is the first general feature which I find quite remarkable and, and quite explanatory. Right? I think this is this, this is the punchline, if you will, of the lecture. So, let I will take you through this uh, discussion. So, take this Lagrangian, okay. I told you that it has thermal diffeomorphism symmetry. 
Okay. I also told you that I didn't write down the kinetic term for the thermal gauge fields. Ignore that part for now. Let's do a thermal gauge transformation on this action, on this Lagrangian. What I should find is I should find a current, and I should find a current that absolutely conserved because it, it's, it's a gauge current. Okay, so let's write down the Bianchi identity for that gauge current. How am I going to do it? I'm going to define the following two gadgets, which are the variation of this Lagrangian with respect to Gij and the variation of this Lagrangian with respect to this gauge field Ai. Remember, beta the beta i vector was not a dynamical object, right? It was just some physical reference guy. So I don't have to write, write down ref derivatives with respect to that. So when I'm doing variations, I, I only have to do variations with respect to these two guys. So for the thermal diffeomorphism, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to do a thermal gauge transformation, which means I have to ask how do these things transform? How, how do gij and ai transform as a function of some gauge parameter lambda? Okay, so let's come into the Lagrangian. First, what I do is I vary the uh, Lagrangian with respect to gij, and then write down the the gauge transformation of gij itself, and then I come and vary the Lagrangian with respect to ai and write down the gauge transformation of ai. You know what the gauge transformation of AI is? It's just the covariant derivative of the gauge parameter, because that's just the gauge field of the transformation. The gauge transformation of Gij, well, there's only one place it can come from. It can come from the fact that x transforms like this, because Gij is built out of x. G mu nu may be a function of x too. But the only explicit variation of gauge dependence is in the x dependence, in the, in the fact that x transforms in this particular representation. If you put that together, you will find that gij itself transforms by a lead derivative along lambda, along beta by a, by a factor lambda. So this is just the variation, standard, simplest variational statement for the gauge, gauge transformation by a gauge parameter lambda. And now you do the standard integration by parts to pull out lambda from, from inside the variation. Okay? Lambda gij is, time, is basically lambda times L beta gij. So lambda just comes out of the first term for free. In the second term you have to integrate by parts because there is one, co this is a covariant derivative, you have to move the covariant derivative on to n, which you can do. Um, okay, and you realize that lamb, this lamb, this arbitrary gauge parameter multiplies this this quantity. Since the action was gauge invariant, this quantity has to vanish. So that's my Bianchi identity for the thermal diffeomorphism symmetry. Okay. You should recognize this, or at least it should ring some bells, and it will be clear in the next, next slide. There's a, so I didn't say what these gadgets were, but I'm varying the Lagrangian with respect to metric, so I should really call this energy momentum, but it has super indices, so I'll call it super energy momentum. Likewise, I'm varying Lagrangian with respect to A, and I told you in equilibrium the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to the thermal thermal circle was giving you free energy. So I'm going to postulate that this is the free energy current. So there's a relation between the super free energy current and the super energy momentum tensor, which is this relation. And this relation holds for free because it holds simply from the thermal diffeomorphism symmetry. Let's unpack this equation. Okay, uh, let, let, let's step, this, step through this in, in a series of steps. So for example, if you have a term like dA and A, if I push it forward to space, target space, I'll get a term like d mu n mu, and then you'll find that you'll get some contribution from the ghost bilinears, which, have ghost num which add up to having ghost number zero from all the fermionic pieces in the Lagrangian. 
And you also get terms from the top component which are fluctuation features. And the same with T A B L beta G A B. So this will also give you T mu nu L beta G mu nu plus fluctuation. Okay. So if you stare at this equation for a second and use that fact, you will see that this piece looks like D mu N mu and this piece looks like T mu nu L beta G mu nu which exactly where the two terms in our adiabatist equation. Okay. So let us isolate these two pieces and stick them on our uh, left hand side and then scan over all other, in, so this is a scalar equation right, so this equation has all indices contracted, let us scan over all other values of i and j, in particular dump all the terms where you have derivatives with respect to theta or theta bar on the right hand side. So i j run from a, a which is some world volume index and then theta and theta bar. So on the left hand side I have only written the derivatives which involve a, on the right hand side I have written derivatives which at least involve single theta or a single theta bar. <coughs> the left hand side has the right structure to be d mu n mu minus half t mu nu l beta g mu nu. So I have isolated the piece I like which was in the area Batist equation. At the right hand side is a scalar built out of Grassmann components or derivatives of Grassmann components of various world volume tensors pushed forward. And it is tempting to immediately say that this is the amount of entropy that is being produced in the system. And that turns out to be correct. So this guy with the minus sign is really what we call delta. And this I remind you for the idea about this. So, this left hand side has the classical pieces that you would see in hydrodynamics. It also has fluctuation terms because they are keeping track of fluctuation terms now which are not present in the classical hydrodynamic theory. And the right hand side has pieces that has the classic, even though it is built out of Grassmann components, the derivatives of Grassmann odd derivatives of Grassmann odd components has classical pieces. Okay. And if you sort of forget about the fluctuations, you can show the delta is precisely given by this combination of the Grassmann odd derivatives of the free energy current uh, in this particular combination of Grassmann odd derivatives of free energy current. This has a very, very nice interpretation which is what I want to emphasize. The theory that we were trying to extract had dissipation. Okay. What that means is that there was no conservation law in the system. I am getting dissipation out of a conservation law. What the hell is going on? I am getting this because in some sense there is a bigger system where everything is conserved and that bigger system lives in super space. If however you are blind to super space and you are only looking at the physical space which is what these projections are doing here, then you will see entropy production. In physical space time which is if you were only looking at hydrodynamics, you would never see there was a thermal gauge symmetry. But there is a thermal gauge symmetry that acts naturally in super space and it produces entropy by having entropy inflow from super space into physical space. Okay? So entropy production is not a mystery in this, in this game. Entry production is the consequence of fundamental symmetries and the fact that it is actually produced in super directions and flowing into physical space. There is a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, is there some kind of uh, like uh, it is entropy production, it is not uh, consumption, like uh, is it 
some is there some kind of bound or like uh, this entropy production or like a positivity or something? Like yeah, delta is positive. But I'll show you why delta is positive. Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean delta is required to be positive. I'll show so you. So if you also consider like uh, some, it's not physical, but if you consider anti dissipation, then system, delta will be negative. That will negative. be the opposite. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, so this this I think is the cleanest, is a is a nicest statement coming out of this construction. And if you are skeptical about why all this formalism was necessary, I, I think this one slide justifies it. Let me give an analogy and why we call it. And it'll also explain why we call it inflow for those of you who are not familiar with the inflow mechanism for Stokes anomalies. So if you have a, if you have a system with a flavor symmetry. The flavor symmetry in quantum theories could be anomalous, which just means that if you do a gauge variation under the flavor symmetry, you don't get back uh, the theory, okay, the, the action is not invariant. But there's a way to cure this, and the standard way to cure this is to use the anomaly inflow mechanism, which was discovered by Callan and Harvey way back in the 80s, which is you can take your system which is anomalous and couple it to another topological system in one higher dimension such that the combined physical plus topological system is non-anomalous. So if you're ever trying to write down effective actions for theories with anomalies, you would not write down an effective action for a theory with anomaly in the same number of space-time dimensions, but rather you would write down a theory, in, say, if you're looking for a top a, 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 B, mm, Adler, Bell, Jacob anomaly in, in um, four dimensions, you would write down a theory which is four-dimensional with your, with your anomalous fields, plus a a five-dimensional John Simon's term, which would soak up the anomaly, and the five-dimensional John Simon's term would be the would would lead to an inflow, which would cancel the anomaly that's there on the bound. So this is, a, of course, physically realized in, in quantum Hall systems. You could think of the topological in two, in three three dimensions. Say you could think of the two three two plus one dimensional quantum uh, John Simon's theory, living on some as as the topological theory. And on the boundary of this guy, you have chiral edge states, which have which, which have a anomalous Hall current, uh, which are but the anomalous Hall current plus the induced boundary term from the John Simons together uh, is anomaly free. But the general principle of anomaly inflow is just that coupling the system, coupling an anomalous system to a topological sector can render the combined system non-anomalous. And exactly that's what's happening here except that we're not coupling it into one physical extra di dimension. We're just coupling our system to the superspace, and the superspace inflow is what's leading to entropy production. There's a, in some sense, this equation says that in physical space-time, the thermal diffeomorphism symmetry has an anomaly. It has a source term on the right-hand side. But it, it doesn't in superspace. There's a very interesting, uh, so since I was using super components of free energy current and so on, you should start to wonder whether I, I'm pulling something fast because the energy momentum tensor also was the energy momentum super tensor. So you, you may start to wonder whether I have energy momentum inflow as well. And the answer turns out to be no, but for a reason that's mysterious, we don't understand it except that we know how it technically works. So the equation of motion that comes from this theory uh, is basically this covariant world volume equation that you can push forward to see what happens in space time. So this is the equation of motion with respect to the X fields. And you have to start wondering whether, and if you sort of try to expand this out in, in write, write out the components, there'll be some pieces that look like energy momentum, standard energy momentum conservation, but there also be some Grassmann derivatives of energy momentum, or Grassmann derivatives of Grassmann components of energy momentum. Now, it's a rather amazing fact to me that all such terms that could potentially spoil the equations of motion, they just cancel out. Okay? Now, I, I don't have an explanation to offer you guys. Uh, I, I just know it's true, in, uh, uh, but uh, it, it's something that's worth understanding. So, so the theory is smart. It knows to produce entropy inflow and knows not to produce energy momentum inflow. 
Okay? So in, in, at the end of the day, this, this equation is simply the usual equation up to Gauss bilinears and fluctuations. Of course, fluctuations and Gauss bilinears you don't see in the classical theory. So this is the correct equation of motion. Does this include all the class of the this hydrodynamic you introduced? Yeah, uh, the, uh, uh, that's my next set of things I was going to say. And so in all cases, uh, this is true. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let, let me show you some examples and, and uh, then, then, then since I have 10 minutes, it's about right, right amount of time. So just to see why delta is positive, that's a, that's a question that was asked earlier. You can now start parameterizing various pieces of Lagrangian. The Lagrangian I just told you, I gave an abstract Lagrangian. It turns out that all of the dissipative pieces of the Lagrangian can be captured by Lagrangians of this form, where this special object gij and gij uh, psi and gij psi bar show up, remind you that they were the theta and theta bar derivatives of the induced matrix. And you can contract them with this eta tensor upgraded to superspace. And this eta tensor now satisfies some, some new, some, some set of symmetry relations. I've upgraded everything to superspace, so there are more signs and so on here, but it's the same thing I was saying before. And then you can now compute what delta is for this action, for this piece of Lagrangian. Okay, now the once I give you the Lagrangian. Delta was computed by computing these combinations, but these combinations came from here, which are defined by doing some variations. So you do the variations, you compute, you assemble, and you find, lo and behold, you get exactly what you had before. So not a surprise, I mean, we sort of knew what to engineer, but it's, it's, it's nice to see that that's the only thing that's allowed, and, and uh, it sort of uh, gives you that as long as this tensor has satis satisfies the right positivity constraints, then entropy is produced. And that there's a nice way to understand this, which is that this the requiring this tensor to have the right positivity con constraint is the same as demanding that the effective action has a positive definite imaginary space. So that's very well explained in this paper. So, uh, There's one other thing I can say, um, which, which I'll just flash through, which is that this spontaneous symmetry breaking of CPT and uh, leads to an identity, a word identity for the symmetry breaking, like the London equation you get from, from in superfluids, in superconductors, which gives you something called the Jardinsky relation. Now, for those of you my, who might not have heard of the Jardinsky relation, I want to say this simply because I think the Jardinsky relation is the, one of the most interesting aspects in statistical mechanics in the last century. So usually you know about the sort of standard fluctuation dissipation uh, or in, in the near equilibrium system. About 20, 20 odd years ago, Chris Jardinsky derived a relation which you should think of as a non-equilibrium fluctuation dissipation relation. The problem he was thinking about was the following. You pre imagine preparing some system in some thermal state, and then you disturb it away from the thermal state and let it evolve. And you, and you ask, and, and you turn on some sources, and then, let, and then switch off some sources after some time. And you ask, how much work do those sources do in the time they switched on? Now, this is a slightly, seems like an odd question to ask, because that depends on what sources you've turned on. But a meaningful question to ask is, what is the average value of work done over all deformations you can turn on for those sources? In fact, an even better question is to ask what the average value of the exponential of the work done is, average over the sources normalized by the initial time, uh, initial temperature. So he proved that this ensemble average guy is actually proportional to the free energy, exponential of the free energy difference between the initial state and the instantaneous final state at the point where you sort of stop turning, uh, where you turn off the sources. Of course, the system will then continue to relax even as if you've turned, on the, turned off the sources. It will relax some other equilibrium point, but that's not what's relevant here. Now, this equation is very, very powerful because if you can write it as follows. If I bring the free energy to the, to the left-hand side, that equation basically says that e to the minus delta s is 1. 
but delta s is the amount of entropy produced okay oh and this statement says that on average the system explores the the the, 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 the average value of entropy produced if you exponentiate it is 1 now this immediately implies the second law okay it's a lot stronger than the second law because the exponential is a convex function the fact that ex expectation value of e to the minus delta s is 1 implies that expectation value expectation expectation value of delta s is positive because jensen's inequality tells you that e to the ex ex expectation value of the exponential is small uh, is smaller than the expectation is larger than the expectation value of the uh, is larger than the exponential of the expectation value. So, so this is the statement, and you can actually see this word identity come out very nicely from our effective actions. I, I won't go through this, but that's one reason why we believe that this is the right right way of, answer, of saying what the field strength is doing. Okay. So finally, I, I'll end by showing you uh, some some examples of effective actions, and then. Um, uh, what we get. So I already showed you the dissipative pieces. If you want the ideal fluid is given by some simple simple form. That's not, nothing more than what we had before. And for in our answer to your question, if you want viscosity, that viscosity action is given by this this form of the action with this particular choice for this eta tensor. And this piece of the action encodes both the viscosity for I mean, you of course have to compute what the physical viscosity is as a function of temperature. That that this doesn't tell you, but it does tell you what the fluctuations associated with viscosity are. In this, in this, in this formula. And if you want sort of examples of other classes of transport, we worked out most of them. We, we haven't bothered with anomalies because it sort of started getting a bit boring, but someone should do. Uh, but here, here are sort of explicit forms for the Lagrangian in various classes. So, so that, that pretty much, as far as I'm concerned, completes the discussion that I started with, that you have these classifications, and then you get various things out of them. OK, do I have two minutes? OK, so I was going to say something about uh, connections to gravity, but rather than sort of flesh out those connections, let me leave you with a challenge I like to leave young people with. So about 10 years ago, uh, we computed the, uh, the physical transport properties of holographic fluids. Okay? This was done using ADSCFT, but the details don't matter. So these systems are conformal, so the energy momentum tensor is quite simple. So they're just there's a certain set of transport coefficients, which I'm calling here lambda one, kappa, lambda two, tau, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are five second order transport coefficients. There's one first order transport coefficient eta, and there's a pressure term, which is given by conformal invariance to be t to the four in four dimensions. And you can just compute these guys in arbitrary dimensions and these there's some specific numbers, okay? You can, these are, these are visible, they're, these are available in the literature. So this is computed using some gravitational technology, it's not computed using some first principle in, in fluid dynamics. But these are the transport data. Now you can take this transport data and ask what Lagrangian they, do they come from? And they come from a very, very simple Lagrangian. I've sort of elided over certain super, super space terms, but this is the answer. Now, the way the previous the, the numbers were computed, the coefficients are computed, was by studying Einstein's equations in a black hole background and using the properties of, of ADS gravity and black holes in ADS gravity to get these answers. Which means that this Lagrangian should be thought of as the boundary Lagrangian of Einstein Hilbert theory in the presence of a black hole in a near equilibrium. So, challenge for you guys is to derive this from the Einstein-Hilbert action. 
Hi. Uh, do you know how to write an effective action for chaos within your formalism? Um, you, you want to know about uh, out of time monitor operators that compute chaos? I mean, like, uh, I know there is a proposal for an effective action for chaos within uh, the, the other approach by Liu, mm -hmm. like a microscopic theory for chaos. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could learn something else with, within your formalism. Well, I think, first of all, we need to generalize our formalism. I, 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 I'll answer this question by saying, how would you compute? How would you incorporate microscopic constraints for computing out of time or correlate? Yes. So let me tell you one thing about the chaos correlator that you're trying to compute. It's not computed by the count contour I discussed, but it's computed by this contour. Now this contour has many more redundancies <laughs> than the contour I, I, I started with. So there are four operators here in the problem that people study, which are at these four points. So this has much more symmetry. And you might ask whether you can, you can write down a theory with generalized or symmetric considerations to this, this guy. In particular, there are three sets of turning points. So you can slide this operator here. You can slide this operator here. You can slide this operator here. And in addition, there is a KMS symmetry that sort of rotates these things into each other. So you want to sort of put those things together. Uh, we've sort of tried, but we don't have a full story. But yes, in principle, you should be able to follow the logic and, and be able to derive something of this kind. OK, thank you. But they correspond to the bigger PRS to some symmetry, like an extent of a symmetry? Yes, so my counting would say that there is a pair of BRST charges here, yeah. a pair of BRST charges here, and a pair of BRST charges here. Um, I would, they are not independent. They transform under some sp6 algebra. If they were independent, life would be simpler. So there's a, there's an extended nt equals, I guess, 6 in this case, topological symmetry with more structure. The algebra, as far as I know, is not really well understood. So that's one thing that has prevented us from understanding what yeah. Okay. Can you make uh, uh, okay this kind of things the end copies? Yes, you and can. The real, okay. And then you still you'd get the still uh, cohomology or the yeah. So with more and more copies, you'll get more charges. You'll get more more cohomologies, more cohomology generators. It just gets you can go yeah. And then you have the category. Sorry? You have the, the topological field theory on this kind of thing. It's okay? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. There was a question back then. So you said that this increase in entropy in the physical system is somewhat related to the flow of entropy from the super space, uh, from the super space essentially. Yeah. So I have essentially two questions. A, a, uh, is there any notion of uh, total entropy being conserved in the total super space? Like yes, there is. So, so the statement, so that, that, that statement is basically the statement that there is a, this thermal gauge symmetry as a gauge symmetry. And because it's a gauge symmetry, it's beyond identity it should just be true. So this statement, the bottom of the slide here, this is a conservation law for the, for the gauge symmetry, right? right? So that just says that there is no, I mean, and, and, and you clearly see that on the right-hand side, there is no source term. Okay. And in, in more general context, is, like, is there a notion that that's how entropy is produced in, in the universe, that it's it somehow, I mean, in a, in a bigger super space, it's conserved, and there is a flow of entropy from such, from such a space to the physical space? Uh, I would like to claim so. I, I don't have any evidence for it. I only know how this works in the near equilibrium hydrodynamic effective field theory. But uh, yes, to a large extent, I, I think that's how the second law should be understood. Uh, in, in some sense, okay, if you ask me how, how should a second law be understood in modern language, I would say go to Jarzinski because that's the sort of, there's an there's a identity to begin with. There is no inequality to begin with. Inequality is a hard to understand. Inequality needs some re re reason to exist. Right. So the Jarzinski identity is really a BRST word identity in this theory or in these classes of theory or in stochastic dynamics in general. And 
that in turn implies a constraint which leads to uh, uh, any, any inequality. Right. And, uh, and I think uh, that's how one should understand it. The fact that both of those statements appear to hold very nicely in superspace suggests to me that that's the general story. Uh, but you know, for now, they're just words. We don't have the technical. We haven't dotted the i's and crossed the t's to show you that actually that's how it works always. OK, thank you. Is it possible to include the uh, uh, back reaction to the uh, to the metric within this formalism? Which metric? Uh, 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 geometrical metric. Well, mm -hmm. see that. Uh, okay. So the there is only one physical metric in this problem, which is the space-time metric on which the fluid is flowing, and because we are only doing fluid dynamics, which are thinking of as effective field theory or some quantum fields. At, high temp at some high temperature, that metric is not dynamical. Yeah. Okay? So it does, there's no back reaction on that metric because it's something you can just pick. So now, you, your question may be so to ask, can I do this in dynamical gravity? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, and that is related to my last slide, which is how do you see this in, from how do you see this boundary action coming from the Einstein-Hilbert action? Uh, I think there's some subtleties, but and the zero order question is how do you do, how, how do you even think about the schwinger keldysh construction more usefully in dynamical gravity theory? And the proposals, for example, Balz and Skenderis have a proposal from about 10 years ago, and various other people have been looking at it recently. But I don't think we've gotten to a stage where we've upgraded many of the discussions I told you in that language. Mm -hmm. Thank you.